Good morning. The Lord cross be with you. My name is Jessica Simpson. I'm one of the members here, and it's my honor to welcome each of you to Mayfield First. We are so glad you joined us today. We also want to welcome our radio listeners on WYMC and people watching on Facebook. If you are watching through Facebook, you can let us know you're here in the comments section. If you have a prayer request, you may post it in the comments as well. Today, we're especially praying for Shirley Kerr, Shirley Kerr, who suffered a stroke and is receiving physical therapy at home, COVID-19 illnesses, tornado victims, Kate Cox, Hope Smith, John Gallion's friend Joshua, who is struggling with some health issues, the family of Marilyn Whitehead. Marilyn passed away this past week. Please keep her sister, Jan Stone, and the rest of the family in your prayers. Fran Conley has returned home from a lengthy hospital stay. Grant Phillips, he's been discharged from the Naval Hospital and will be transferring to a medical platoon for further recovery. Beth Battles has returned home from the hospital and will be having cataract surgery soon. Sue Greer continues therapy at Green Acres and is doing well. Allison Smith McGillian is at Mercy Health in Paducah for rehab following her stroke. We want to lift up two of our churches in the Purchase District. This week's churches are Arlington United Methodist Church and Lovelessville United Methodist Church. Uh, their preacher is Reverend Keith Osborne. The candle on your right has been lit to represent the folks at Arlington and Lovelessville. Please keep them in your thoughts and prayers this week. Now on to our sh now on to our shout outs. Uh, we want to give a shout out to Kent Hunt. We love and miss you and hope you are doing well. Uh, give a shout out to the teachers. It's getting to be that time of year when school starts back up, which, which means, means the teachers are gearing up also. Know that you are loved and appreciated. May you all be blessed and have a wonderful new school year. I uh, want to give a shout out to the UMCOR disaster case managers. These people are working with people of the community that were hit by the December 10th tornado. They meet with them and provide resources and or direct them to resources. A big thanks to all of you for holding the hands of our needy and being the hands and feet of Christ. We are so glad you chose to join us for worship this morning. I want to take an opportunity to remind you that worship is what we do. It's not just something you watch. Together, we are here to pray, glorify, and give thanks to God through Jesus Christ for all the benefits and blessings of this life. Now, our prayer to, worship, to open worship is for all of us to pray. The words are printed in your bulletin. Lord of hope and peace, we have come this day asking for your mercy. Grant us your pardon. We have come this day seeking peace in our lives. Grant us peace. Teach us how to be compassionate disciples for you. For we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, am I on? We have pulpit mics this week. Thank you. We found out 30 minutes after the service last week what was wrong, and it's called a fuse box. Somebody had turned the levers off, and we didn't know... There was, there was one lever, it was off, and we went, oh, well, that's nice to know. So anyway, we've got it fixed. I think you can hear me. Before we start our first song, um, next Sunday is going to be our All Music Sunday. I know some people are going to be out, and that's fine. Uh, we do, we are, biggest thing is we are starting at 10 a.m., not 9. Say 10 a.m. 10 a.m. Not 9, 10 Okay, because if you come in early, you're going to work, okay? <laughs> I, I, ain't, I ain't got time to play with y'all, okay? Uh, there will be special guest musicians. They've been around us before, just putting that out. they got about three pieces. We will have a hymn medley, probably some old stuff, you know, or whatever. We'll, I'll figure it out by tomorrow. Uh, there will be a section in there where congregants get to pick the hymn, or I call it Stump the Keyboardist. And Justin will be here playing organ, which I said, we ought to just charge money at the door for that, you know. And I said, Lisa's in for it. I said, these two together, forget about it. Oh, and she goes, she, I said, you don't understand. You two are fabulous. Putting y'all together, 
<laughs> Nobody will know what hit them. And the biggest thing is there is no sermon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, sorry. What? What? Notice they clapped some of them. <laughs> Notice some of them didn't so they wouldn't get their names taken. You just made the list. <laughs> All right. Just want to put that out there. Um, blah, blah, blah. Let's stand. Turn to number 130. God will take care of you all four verses. Be not dismayed, whatever be done, God will take care of you. Be not dismayed, all the time, God will take care of you. God will take care of you. Please join me in the prayer of illumination, which is found in your bulletin. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first scripture reading today is from Hosea chapter 1, verses 2 through 10. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take for yourself a wife of whoredom, and have children of whoredom. For the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Gomer daughter of De Blame, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, Name him Jezreel, for in a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. On that day I will break the bow of Israel in the valley, in the valley, valley of Jezreel. Buckley gave me a wonderful <laughs> scripture. Giving Katie a break. She conceived again and bore a daughter. Then the Lord said to him, Name her Lo-Ruhamah, for I will no longer have pity on the house of Israel or forgive them. But I will have pity on the house of Judah, and I will save them by the Lord their God. I will not save them by bow or by sword or by war or by horses or by horsemen. When she had weaned Lo-Ruhamah, she conceived and bore a son. Then the Lord said, Name him Lo-Ami, 
For you are not my people, and I am not your God. Yet the number of the people of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which can be neither measured nor numbered. And in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, it shall be said to them, Children of the living God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. That's a hard reading. It's a hard reading for a lot of reasons. We hear that God wanted his prophet to stand in and marry a prostitute, just to make a point. That those children were going to be named in such a way as to reflect God's displeasure with an entire nation. Can you imagine bearing that name, to be Jezreel or to be Lo Ruhama or Lo Ami, not my people? That's a tough name for any first grader. We live in difficult times. We live in, we live in these moments where we wonder if we are following after God or not. And after the news last week that one of my dear friends and colleagues had been shot and killed during a carjacking, I'm more convinced of that than I ever have been. Services for the Reverend Dr. Atura Eason Williams will take place soon. And when we gather, we're going to have to do some difficult work because honestly, the first response that I had was disbelief, followed very quickly by rage. It's a hard time. <coughs> It's a difficult thing, and not just because of incidents like that, but because of the fact that sometimes we don't seem to be listening when God talks, and God has to take some very, very distinct measures to get our attention, like calling a prophet to marry into prostitution and to name his children in ways that are appalling to us. It's all about listening for the Holy Spirit, and that brings us to our time of prayer today. A time of brokenness for some of us, a time of anger for some of us, a time of confusion and frustration for some of us. But we know that we serve the living God. We do not serve the God of some ancient mystical religion that we can only read about in our Bibles. We read about God in our Bibles to better understand what we experience, not only today but every day as we open ourselves to receive the Holy Spirit. So now, more than ever, I invite you to a time of listening, to know that the Holy Spirit seeks to have his voice in your ear, that God's will in your life is something that can be made known to you, not only through the reading of scripture, but by prayer and listening. Let us pray together. God of power and might, God of the broken and hurting, God of righteousness and justice. We cry out to you with so many questions. We speak your name knowing that you love us, knowing that the wickedness that oppresses our culture is something that you're well, well aware of. And we wonder why it continues. When we are quiet, O oh God, we ask these questions in the still places in our heart, what few there are. And it seems that the answer comes back to us again and again, that you are doing something about it, that you have raised up your people. We are your people, O oh God. And we find ourselves helpless because we forget the power of your spirit among us. We find ourselves weak and afraid because we forget the power of Jesus Christ within us. And we find that we are 
at a loss for words, O oh God, when we have failed to pick up the very word that you have sent to us, the messages of hope found in our Bibles, the messages of encouragement that we are easily able to identify in the life of your son, Jesus Christ, the living word. And as we have been called to take his place and to become the body of Christ, we ask, we seek, we knock at the gates of heaven and we ask, O oh Lord, how long? And so in our distress, we cry out to you, recognizing that we are all going through difficulties of some kind or another. But when we lift our heads from our own distresses, we find that we are not alone and that the answer that our neighbor may need may dwell within us. And the answer that we may need may well lie within the bounds of our neighbor's capabilities. And so instead of a moment of silence, we choose to listen. Rather than a moment of silence to honor the fallen, we take the words of the prophet, we make them our own, and we add to those words the gospel of Jesus Christ, the same Jesus who gathered disciples to himself and taught them what to say when they didn't know what to say with these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, hello, my name is Caitlin Simpson. Um, today's Psalter is from Psalm 85 and can be found in the hymnal on page 806, and your part will be in bold. Okay. Lord, you showed favor to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You pardoned all of their sin. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God, our salvation, and put away your indignation toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let me hear what God will speak, for the Lord will speak peace to his people to his faithful, to those who turn to the Lord in their hearts. Surely salvation is a hand for those who fear the Lord, that glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before the Lord and make God's footsteps away. Let's stand once again. Turn to number 534. When you sing all three verses of Be Still My Soul.
Our next scripture reading is from Colossians 2, 6 through 19. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. <clears throat> See to it that no one takes, your, takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the universe, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have come to fullness in him, who is the head of every ruler and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a spiritual circumcision by putting off the body of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ. When you were buried with him in baptism, you were also raised with him through faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in trespasses in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with him. When he forgave us all our trespasses, erasing the record that stood against us with its legal demands. He set this aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public example of them, triumphing over them in it. Therefore, do not let anyone condemn you in matters of food and drink or of observing festivals, new moons, or Sabbaths. These are only a shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Do not let anyone disqualify you, insisting on self-abasement and worship of angels, dwelling on visions puffed up without cause by human way of thinking, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows with a growth that is from God. The grace withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. We come now to a time of offertory, time to give back to God that which has come to us from God, a chance for us to recognize the blessings that we have and to share those with the people who need them most and to ensure the ongoing cause of Jesus Christ and his kingdom, which is now, even now, at hand. There are a, a few ways that I want to remind you of, and for those of you who are with us for the first time, I want to let you know about. In our offertory, the first and best way if you are here in the building is to leave your offering in one of the offering boxes at the front or the back of the sanctuary. If you have trouble finding them, just look for the praying hands. And uh, if you still have trouble finding them, uh, let one of us know, and we'll make sure that you are able to locate that here in the sanctuary. You can also uh, go online to mayfieldfirst.com and click on any of the tabs that say giving. If you have trouble with any of that, you can call us, and we'll be happy to let you know how some of those things work. You can text the word GIVE with a dollar amount to 364-999-4480, or you can mail your gift in to Mayfield First Post Office Box 766 here in Mayfield, Kentucky, 42066. But I want to remind you that at least a portion of every gift that you give to God should be a matter of your time, your talents, your gifts, your service, your presence, those things that we promise in baptism, those things that we promise in daily discipleship. So whatever that is between you and God, make sure that you're giving that back, whether it's to your community or to your family or to the people around you or to some place that we have not yet been sent but will be shortly. I ask you now to stand as we sing the doxology as another way to say thank you to God for all the gifts that we have received. Please remain standing for the reading of the gospel today from St. Luke, the 11th chapter, verses 1 through 13. Hear now the word of the Lord. Jesus was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. 
Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. He also said to them, suppose one of you has a friend and you go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread for a friend of mine has arrived and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, do not bother me. The door has already been locked and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks, receives. And everyone who searches, finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. This is the word of God for you who are the people of God. Thanks be to God. I know, right? Flip that breaker. This one doesn't have a breaker. I don't know what's going on. I had a problem with Hosea and that passage of Scripture because of the difficult words that were found in it. But I also had a hard time with the Psalter today because it sounded to me like people who were asking for something and weren't getting what they were asking for. You ever get that feeling as you're reading through Scripture or listening to someone's prayer that they've been praying and praying and praying and persisting and persisting and still nothing happens? I have a hard time with that. I alluded to it in the pastoral prayer that sometimes we cry out to God and say, how long are you going to sit there and do nothing? And God's response quite often is, I am doing something. I'm sending you. We have a hard time with that because we like to call on others to do for us when we can especially when we feel like it's outside of our area of expertise. I don't know that I need to go to the hospital. Let the preacher do that. I'm not sure if I need to do any counseling of my friends and let them know what I think about Scripture because I don't feel confident in what I know. I hear that again and again as a pastor. For the last 25 or 30 years, going on to youth ministry and then to Uh, young adult ministry, and then working as a pastor in the pulpit, as I have for the last few years, I hear that again and again. I just don't know what to say. I don't know how to say it. Scripture reminds us on a fairly regular basis that we have to ask for the things that we need. It brings us squarely into the gospel today, where Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray. In the first section of this pericope that was read in your hearing this morning, the disciples say, teach us how to pray. Well, 
didn't they grow up Jewish? I mean, how did that work? About this time, for maybe 200 years or so, there was something known as the Amidah, where rabbis were teaching in the synagogues, not necessarily in the temple, but in the temple precincts, of course, from time to time. But in the synagogues, here is what you need to say when you pray. And the prayers had different parts. And if you look at those Jewish prayers, they line up pretty well with the Lord's Prayer. It's different based on what we have in Scripture. Luke and Matthew don't necessarily agree completely. There's more to Matthew than there is to Luke. That doesn't mean anything. Because what it is, is a format for prayer. It's a way to say what you need to say when you don't know what to say. Have you ever been there? Believe it or not, I find myself from time to time at a loss for words. And when I lose those words, I hear you guys snickering on the second row over there. I do. I come to those places where I just don't know what to say. Sometimes those are moments of, of great surprise when someone steps all the way up and, and just knocks it out of the park for Jesus. Sometimes it's, it's a moment where I think something's going to go one way and it goes an entirely different direction as it did a Wednesday or so ago when we were talking about our second set of listening session ideas. And we started to realize that everything that we were talking about hinges on the notion of who's going to do it. How's it going to get done? What's it going to cost? We want it. We're even asking for it. But how's it going to get done? I was at a loss for words for a few moments in that conversation that we were having. Monday when... I got texts from multiple colleagues. They all said the same thing because they had all been told the same way. There's been a tragedy in our annual conference. Call me when you can. And when you get the same message from folks like that, you wonder what in the world is going on. Something bad has happened. And I called one and then called the other, and I managed to get them both on the phone at the same time, although one was on hold and I didn't hear what he had to say for a minute. He continued to yell through the phone even though he was on hold because he was afraid something had happened to me upon hearing what he had to tell me, that my friend Artura had been killed. We comforted one another and we called one another and there was a lot of silence on the phone because there are no words to describe what that's like. Atura was the heart of our cohort in my doctoral work. She was a district superintendent. She was a fantastic pastor. She would have given those carjackers anything that they needed. Anything. And I don't know if she misunderstood that he had a gun and was trying to keep him from making a mistake that was going to be on his record forever, or if he just panicked and pulled a trigger. We don't know. We don't know. I don't know that I'm able to know, even if somebody were to tell me. But I've been asking. I've been seeking. I've been knocking on the doors that might lead to answers, and there aren't any. Not yet. she would have given anything that he had asked her for within reason. And that's, that's the heart of what Jesus is saying in this gospel message. In this last part, in this last phrase in the pericope where Jesus is saying, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find it, knock and the door will be opened for you. We have a tendency to want to wait for it to come to us instead of searching for the answer, instead of looking for what it is that God wants us to be doing and who it is that God wants us to be. My grandmother used to tell me that, yes, God does feed the birds of the air, but he doesn't throw the food in the nest. you got to get out there and get after it sometimes. But we have this hang-up. That's works righteousness. If we have to earn our salvation, you're not earning your salvation, friends and neighbors. Your salvation is cemented 
in what Jesus did for us on the cross. What we're talking about is your discipleship. What we're talking about is what do you do with it once it's been granted to you, this opportunity to become more like Jesus. It doesn't just happen magically because we've said the sinner's prayer. It doesn't just happen magically by osmosis when we sit in the pews of the church. None of that is described in the New Testament. Those are not the answers. Those are not the things. It's taking the teachings that Jesus gives to us. It's taking the explanations that Paul provides for us and living into this new kingdom. Ask. Seek. Knock. And yet, we sit and we wait for it to come to us. Sometimes that's all we can do, and that's fine. The example that I frequently give is when we have communion, you're expected to come up and get it. But there are times when you can't, and that's okay. Just raise your hand and we'll bring it to you. Just call us and we'll bring it to your home. But for those of you who can, those of you who are able, come and get it. You can hear the dinner bell ringing. Paul has some... Paul has something here for us in his letter to the Colossians. Paul was dealing with a group that isn't exactly like our group. Here in the United States, I think we have more in common with the Corinthians. You know, we're, we're very much into the sensory. We like to do things that make us feel good. But we do have this in common with the Colossians. The Colossians were taking a little bit from a variety of religions. And pulling all that in together, they were trying to make something for themselves that made them happy. Christianity has done the very same thing. Paul says specifically, don't let empty philosophy speak to your Christian understanding of what Jesus did for you on the cross. Well, what is he talking about? Well, without going into a whole lot of detail, he's talking about the ideas of Plato. That there's a here and a there. There's an earth and a heaven, and there the twain shall meet. There's this idea that we have to do what we need to do to get right with Jesus so that we can escape this nasty old world. That's Plato. That's not Jesus. The reason you know it's not Jesus is because at the end of the book, spoiler alert, the kingdom of heaven comes here. And that which was separated for a time is made whole. Shalom. This is at the heart of who we are. Not, oh, we're a bunch of evil, physical flesh bags that are filled with sin, and the only way to get away from this sin is to fly away and to avoid this physical existence. Paul was saying you got to stop doing that. Because when you do that, you start looking around at people and saying, let them suffer because that suffering will be over when they die and they go to heaven. Or worse, you get these cults who decide that the best thing to do is just to end life and go on to that eternal reward. None of that is what Jesus would have us to understand. And yet we persist in this notion that there's not much that we can do about life here. So we'll just wait until there. That kind of thinking led to slavery and the justification of beating people because it was just their physical body. And that physical body's not going to heaven. Thank you, Plato. You've ruined it for us all. There's also this Epicurean notion, and I won't get into all of that, but all of these philosophies that that come to bear on Christian thinking and start to twist it. And instead of being the last shall be first and the first shall be last, we get into ideas of, well, we are the ones who pay for things around here. We should have the voices that determine what it is that we're going to do. We're the ones who are contributing the most, physically, financially. So we're the ones who are most important. When Jesus is telling us the exact opposite, that it is the people who are in need who must come first. So with Epicurus and Plato and a hundred other influences on Christianity, we find ourselves knocking on all these doors. We find ourselves asking all these questions. We find ourselves seeking for the answers. But like the sermon graphic illustrates, we've got several doors to choose from. I find it ironic that we have so many people who complain that we're not doing enough Bible-based teaching and preaching. 
I have it in my head that there are folks out there who have their idea of what it means to be Bible-based, and then there's what actually is said in Scripture. And that difficulty comes from the fact that we're not asking the text to say what it needs to say. We're not seeking the answers within the text that we need to. We're instead coming with our answers and asking the text to support those answers. That's called eisegesis. And you'd get flunked in seminary for doing it. <laughs> You're not allowed to bring your ideas to the Bible to have them justified. You're to take the ideas of Scripture and the power of Jesus Christ and use that to justify your life, to make it right, to change its direction, to go in a different way, to repent, to make a 180 degree turn. But instead, we try to find things that make us feel better about the path that we're on. We ask the questions that we know we're going to get a good answer to, and we never seem to ask those hard questions that are going to make us change what we do, who we are, how we spend, how we talk, how we exist with one another. I start to feel like that friend in the second section of the Luke passage where folks are knocking on the door and they're asking for anything and everything. Some days it's bread, and yet yeah, Jesus is right. I'll get up and get that bread. If you ask me for something you need and you need it right now, I'm fine with that. But I learned a long time ago that there are some questions that have to be answered with not just yet. Not just yet. Not right now. Because what is being asked for it's not what is needed. What is being asked for is not only not needed, it's going to be harmful. It, we're past frivolous when we get to harmful, you see? People have taken this passage and they've turned it into a gimme prayer. You know what I'm talking about? Some of my colleagues in other denominations have decided that this passage justifies being persistent in asking God for that new bicycle or asking God for that new house or asking God for whatever. Lord, do what you need to do with me, but just give me the new car. This is not what this passage promises. Now, Matthew gets a little squirrely with the language. Matthew says, if you ask, then you will receive good things. Jesus here in Luke says, if you ask, why would God withhold the Holy Spirit. See, Matthew was talking about a good thing and the good things that come as a result of interacting with the Holy Spirit. The things that these people lacked. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, Self-control, these are all fruits of interacting with the Spirit and spending time with the Spirit. But the Spirit doesn't just come around and drop these things down your chimney. The Spirit may flow back and forth in your pews as we worship here today. But if you're here passing time and just marking the moments because someone told you you had to be here today, I can't promise you that the Spirit's going to drop that in your lap. But if you're able to make the simple turn from hands down, arms crossed, to arms open, palms receptive. That's a metaphor, kids. You don't have to sit like this to receive the Holy Spirit. But if you go from a passive role to a receptive role, and then maybe even to an active role, maybe just maybe, that's when the Spirit says, oh, I see someone who needs something so that they can accomplish something for the sake of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. So I want you to examine yourselves today and figure out what doors you're knocking on. I want you to examine your efforts today and determine if they exist. I want you to ask yourself when the last time you opened Scripture to an unfamiliar passage happened to be, when you studied a book for the sake of studying the book to see what you could wring out of it rather than what you could wrangle from it. Scripture doesn't read itself to us. 
And even though it's in English, I wish I could tell you that it's plain English. It is not plain English. Because if it were, it would indicate that Jesus probably spoke English with a Midwestern accent. I can tell you on good authority that's not the case. From language to language, from translation to translation to translation to translation to transcription to transcription, it's tough to keep those meanings intact when the words have multiple layers. Read your Bibles, but read them diligently. Read them not as if you're opening a fortune cookie, for Pete's sake, but as if you were opening a book to study it, to allow it to change your lives. On Wednesdays when we do Bible study over at the school, and on the Wednesdays that we did Bible study before COVID, I never once pulled punches. Bible study is not intended to be something easy and breezy. It's not intended to be something that people come to and listen and feel better after they've been there for a few minutes. That's not what a Bible study is for. It's to teach you how to read your Bible when you get back home. It's like going to a yoga class. If you go once a week and that's the only time you do yoga, you're not doing yoga. You're going to a class that teaches you how to do yoga. But if you learn at that class and take that home and do those exercises, you'll see results seven times faster than just going once a week. Do the math. We're knocking on the wrong doors way too often in Christianity. But friends, what happens when you open that door where Jesus is waiting? What happens when you open the right door and you hear the hard things and you absorb and integrate those into your life? What happens then is that you come nearer to the kingdom. That's not salvation. That's the full life that God promises once salvation has been achieved, once that wholeness has been made possible, which is everything that Jesus was about. And it's the reason he taught his disciples to pray with one voice. It's the reason we're expected to pray with one voice. But instead, we go off to our corners and we hear the words that come to us from a variety of places in the world. I did the math a long time ago, and I know I'm never going to have more of your attention than the talking heads. I know that the cable news networks have so much more of your life wrapped around their little finger than I ever will. My only hope is that you're taking these words to heart and that you spend as much time in Scripture as you do listening to what they have to say. Or that you're reading or listening to podcasts, for example, from folks who are commenting and commenting wisely on what scripture has to say instead of listening to talk radio and hearing all these people trying to wind you up and make you afraid make you mad and tell you who the bad guy is and why you ought to hate him and how if we just band together with the like-minded folks we can overcome all of this nonsense because they're stealing our country they're tearing our nation they're destroying our church Boo. Fear doesn't work when you know the one who has hope to give you and can bring you through all of those trials and tribulations. It shouldn't take a prophet marrying a prostitute to get your attention. It shouldn't take an outlandish set of names for children born into prostitution to make us see that God is not excited about some of the things that we are saying and doing. We should not have to raise our voices with the psalmist and ask how long, and yet here we are. We should be paying much more careful attention to the words of Jesus when we learn how to pray, and more specifically to the words of Paul, so that we know that some of the things that we are praying for are straight up nonsense. Paul says, avoid that talk of angels. Paul said, avoid worship of angels in particular. Avoid those philosophies that try to worm their way into who we are as Christians. Read about the Colossians and what they were studying. Read up on who they were and what they were chasing after and why it was so hard to get Christianity in there edgewise 
in and amongst not only all of the gods that they were already worshiping, but all of the ideas that they were chasing, all of the mistaken ideas. You know, the church spent the first few centuries declaring heresy after heresy, trying to keep those things out. And when I took a class on heresies, someone had the temerity to say, so how long has this been gone? And the professor looked right at her and said, what makes you think they ever left? Those heresies bring us right back around, not to things that are evil. It's not Satan trying to rip our souls out. It's misguided, well-meaning people trying to make sense of things that they don't understand with the fear of trusting those who have spent their lives trying to read through some of this material and to understand the cultural contexts that we're pressing in. And without knowing who the Colossians were and fully understanding who we are, guess where the next letter to the Colossians could be addressed? To me or to you. So when you knock on that door, Make sure it's the door you need to knock on. Insert the cute story about the young pastor who went to the hospital and went to visit someone, got the wrong room, prayed with him, and went home thinking he had done his job. Raise your hand if that was you. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you think you're doing great work. You've prayed over a body in a bed, but it was the wrong someone. And the one who was expecting you just continued to wait. Where are you knocking? What are you asking for? And how much closer to your Bible do you need to get to hear the answers that your heart is longing for, but your brain keeps confusing with all these other ideas that are coming in from God knows where? It's hard to let go of some of these ideas because some of these wrong-headed ideas didn't come about in the last 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. They came about in the last 100 years, the last 400 years. And they've been passed down from people that we trusted. And hearing someone say you're knocking on the wrong door about something that your grandmother taught you, believe me, that's never been easy for me. And I dare say it won't be easy for you. But when we look to see who Jesus was and what he said and what he was trying to accomplish and we try to justify what we're doing in the world today in Christianity, particularly in evangelical Christianity, what are we doing? Where are we heading? Look to the church at Colossae to figure that out. But more importantly, listen to the words of Jesus to figure out the solution. If you're asking and it has something to do with a physical need, that's fine. If it has to do with a physical want, not so much. Your best bet is to ask God to give you what God knows you need. Luke was kind enough to spell it out for us. <laughs> if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Let your reading be tempered with the understanding provided by the Holy Spirit and let the traditions of the church, the ones that are wholesome and pure, let those guide your understanding of what it means to be a Christ follower in this world today. And for those of you who are not knocking on the wrong door but just aren't knocking yet, I pray that you will be led by someone who has to the doorway where Jesus waits for you. I would be honored to be that person. But it might be the person sitting next to you in the pew. It might be the neighbor across the fence. It might be a relative across the miles. Ask. Seek. And knock. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If today's the day that you need to make that commitment, as we sing our closing hymn, it's time for you to meet me at the chancel or to meet someone 
at the chancel. If it's your first time, right here. Give your life to Jesus. Let Jesus know that you want to be a follower of his. And I'll do everything within my power to give you the tools that you need to inform your life so that you can be his student. That's what disciple means. If you gave your life to Jesus, but you didn't commit yourself to the discipleship that goes with it, and your Bible sits dusty and forgotten, and your faith is sort of falling off around the edges, meet me here. Give the rest of what you held back to God. If you're a part of another congregation, but you're ready to be a part of this one because the Holy Spirit has led you here, or because you think you need to be here, have that conversation with whoever your pastor is now, with whoever your Sunday school teacher is, your classmates, your pew mates from worship. But before you make any rash decisions, make sure you're leaving for the right reasons so that we'll know that you're arriving here for the right reasons. For the rest, I'll leave the chancel rail on that side, your right, my left, for whatever prayers you need to pray that you don't need me as your intercessor because we have Jesus. If you need to come forward and remember and pray and ask or to seek or to knock, come and do that as we sing our closing hymn. benediction is found in your hymnal, I'm sorry, in your bulletin. For those of you who are watching at home, it's right there on the screen. Let these words speak to you from the lips of your neighbor, even as you speak them aloud to the people around you as the good word that sends us forward this day. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you, may he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Get out there and knock on some doors and may Jesus provide the answers that you need. Amen.